we got home at 2 a.m. sometimes, but we didn't care because we all knew that it was for the benefit of the podcast. And I think that was the moment where we felt, wow, is this what the journey is going to be about? And I think that's what takes us to where we are today. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Daily Coaching Podcast where we talk to players, managers and specialists within the football and coaching industry Um, and today we're going to be talking all about creating a football podcast and I'm absolutely delighted today to be joined by a very special guest. He's one of a trio. I'm welcoming (laughs) Dot from the Beautiful Game Podcast. Dot, massive appreciation and thank you for you taking the time and joining me today. Um, And if you can, I always like to start with people's journey. So if you can, take it all the way back to as a kid and then kind of bringing us up to more where you are today as a kid wow <laughs> that's going way back man um obviously before we start thank, thanks for having me I really appreciate you know being on your show you're doing brilliant things but if I had to take it back to day dot I'm from South East London um yeah. SE15 I grew up on the Ooh. same road as Rio Ferdinand <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> um, and yeah I've always loved football I'm a Liverpool fan. My whole family support Liverpool. So I pretty much had no other option but to support Liverpool. Um, so, yeah, then I became a teenager, 11, 12, 13. I went to secondary school in Peckham, St. Thomas the Apostle. And, yeah, I've just loved football. But the thing is, when I spoke about football back in the day, it was always more you know, detailed and insight. If you ask me, oh, what player scored on the week? And I'll give you the answer within two seconds. Or if you ask me, what sort of formation did that team play? I can tell you, yeah, they played a 4-4-2 diamond or they played a 4-3-3. So I was always someone that loved the game, but I always, you know, dig deeper to try and provide the best analysis from a young age. And I think it's helped me to where I am today. Fantastic. Um, I have to get one elephant in the room out of um, before I continue. Obviously, since you're from Peckham, I have to hold my hands up. I'm from Deptford. So, um... <laughs> you know what's mad? You know what's mad? I actually moved to Lewisham. So, I'm, I'm originally from Peckham, but then I made the transition to Lewisham, to Lewisham in secondary school. So, I'm very familiar with Deptford. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice, nice. So, listen, there are two great areas and there's obviously a lot of football in and things that are part of it. It's interesting you mentioned, and the reason why I always like to take it back is just because you get a, a good, honest opinion of, like, you know, people's journeys and, and kind of how long they've been, I say involved in football, but kind of, like you just said, the love of the game. And it's interesting you mentioned about sort of just how you used to talk about football because the memories that I have of talking about football in secondary school, it would be you come into school about maybe 8.30. It was the only time people would ever try and be punctual for school just because yeah. they knew that if, say, for example, if, like, Man United lost or Chelsea lost, by the way, when Man United were in the Champions League, um, mm. <laughs> but when Man United lost or Ch- Chelsea lost or Liverpool lost, and you would have that 15-minute window to absolutely before. banter the people who support those clubs before school actually starts. Like, yeah, it's crazy. You know, you know what was peak for me? Like... Liverpool weren't good. So I always used to feel the banter. Oh, you lot lost to blah, blah, blah. And obviously back in the day, it was all about Arsenal, Man United. So every time there was banter, I was just looking from the side, trying to chime in a few, one or two things. But really and truly, when it was time to stick on Liverpool, I had to defend them because that's my team. But I didn't really have a leg to stand on. And I remember like when I used to have parents' evening, Every single report, he does not stop talking about Liverpool. He's always talking about <laughs> Liverpool in class. So it's just crazy, man. Did you know what's funny about that, though, as well? Mm. And it's a big thing where, like, teachers... And, listen, don't get me wrong, teachers are great. I think, obviously, at school, we always used to hate them. But they always used to come out with things like that. Like, you know, mm. oh, they always used to talk about football. Football's <laughs> constantly on their mind. But, listen, I, I guarantee you, if your teachers are watching this or watching your, your, your podcast now, I bet they're thinking... Yeah. You know what? I'm, I'm glad you talked about yeah. football that time now because look how long you've, you, how far you've come. Nice, nah, it's mad, it's mad. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, man. But now listen, like, so <laughs> you said obviously through school, you, you, you know, keen football interest, um, unfortunately for Liverpool, um, but, you know, football is always a big thing. Um, and then kind of taking us up to more recent times, um, obviously, you know, a lot of people know you from the Beautiful Game podcast, which we'll come into in a bit, but obviously, you know, unbelievable uh, work that you're doing. How did that actually come about? Because I've heard things before where, like, it was, you know, yourself or one of the other members of the Beautiful Game podcast who you met in school and you kind of used to talk about football. But yeah, what was that sort of 
initiation of the process? Um, yeah, me and Dej were best friends. We went to the same secondary school, St. Thomas the Apostle. Um, and from day dot, I remember the first day in year seven, I think I met him in the canteen. And obviously, I have an older brother and he has an older brother. So we kind of knew that we we're going to bump into each other, but we didn't know when. <laughs> So then I was like, oh, what team do you support? And he was like, Liverpool. And then I was like, yeah, my guy. You get what I'm trying to say? Straight away. So <laughs> back then, we always had that telepathic relationship on the pitch when it even came to playing football and also off the pitch when it came to talking about football. But to take you back to where the Beautiful Game podcast started, it initially started from us talking about football with one of our friends. Um, okay. and we used to talk in the car um, and we used to analyse the weekend's matches so we'll probably take the top six results and just go through them so it was around a 15 to 20 minute YouTube show but that came to his natural conclusion because the first the person that we were supporting wanted to do his own thing and he kind of went AWOL if I'm being, being pretty honest <laughs> he, just, he just went missing but then these were the times when I think Liverpool were top of the league and Manchester City were chasing them down. And eventually Manchester City ended up winning the league with 100 points. And I think Liverpool, what was it? Or they had 98 points and Liverpool had 97 oh, points yeah, or yeah, something yeah, like yeah. that. And obviously this was towards the back end of the season that we stopped recording with my friends. So I'm in my group chat. And my boys are like, yo, 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 you don't think you're clever. You are not talking about football anymore because Liverpool are putting in the league title. <laughs> And I was like, no, it's not that. Basically, we want to create a platform, but the way we want it to run, we need to get our house in order because we can do it as a two, but yeah. we feel that we work best in a trio. So then me and Dej are coming up with ideas as to who can be you know, the perfect host to connect the conversation. So we come up with names and I'm like, Dej, how does... A sound and he's like I don't know if he's going to be committed how does B sound I don't know if she's the right fit for what we're looking for how does C sound yeah he's got the football knowledge but I'm not sure if he's going to be equally committed as the way we are and I think that was the key thing for us we need to find someone that shares the same passion as us because yeah. it's all well and good getting the most talented person in the world but if they don't have the passion and the drive for what you're trying to bring them into, it's going to fall short eventually. You get what I'm trying to say? So 100%. obviously after a few days, few weeks of, you know, knocking heads with Dej, I was like, Dej, man, I know the perfect man for the job. And that's Budge. And Budge is someone that I've known for a very long time. He's one of my close friends. And he's always had that football knowledge and that deep thought of mind when it comes to football. So I was like, you know what? We're going to have Budge as the host and we're going to be the two pundits, should I say. And then literally that, that was the form or that was the formation of the Beautiful Game podcast, to be honest. Nice, no, quality. And it's, it's interesting you mentioned the word formation. So I was going to say, it's like building a football team. You know, literally. it's like you're building your team. You're thinking of each of your qualities. Um, I know, um, you know, Budge is famous for his intros exactly. and, you know, exactly. things like that. It's, but it's true. It's like the, the qualities that each of you has um, and like you said, that team chemistry, I think that's mm -hmm. one of the clear things which is um, evident on a lot of your podcasts and your videos, that just how well all of you get on with each other. Um, and I agree with you. I think one of the big things, and I'll be honest with you, it's one of the reasons why I've probably gone down a solo route because of that commitment element that, you know, mm -hmm. it's so hard to find, you know, when people are available. Even when you speak to guests, you know, they'll t tell you one time and then all of a sudden I can't do them. I need to do a different time. So I can imagine that, yeah, that must be quite a big thing in terms of actually having people that you can not only rely on, but also trust their opinion. Yeah. Is, is, would you say so? Yeah, no, definitely. Trust is, is everything, man. You can't be working with people that you don't trust. So that's the thing with me, Dej and Budge, like our connection, we all trust each other and we know that if we're putting down an opinion or if we disagree with things, it's all for the good of the podcast and it's not to crush anyone's ego or to make me feel like I'm the best. It's all about, you know, getting the best outcome for the platform. And I think that's what's made us get to the stage, at, you know, where we're at, where we're at now.
Yeah, no, fantastic. And yeah, let's uh, like look into that. So obviously, mm. you know, it's grown um, incredibly well in terms of guests, but not only guests, but also quality of conversation as well. Um, and insight as well. I know that's one of the big things which I've heard you guys speak about in terms of, you know, being able to provide a platform where you provide insight for what, let's say in inverted commas, the normal football fan may not get access to. Mm. Um, how did, um, and I know it's obviously it says it within the title, you know, a beautiful game and that's what obviously football is, but how did actually the beautiful game name come about? Um, and also, yeah, talk us through sort of how it's grown and it's gone from idea to uh, I checked it out earlier. You're almost on a million views. It's incredible. <laughs> it's crazy. It's um, crazy. I didn't even know that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how did a beautiful game podcast name come about? So we've always like just said the beautiful game or it's a beautiful day for the beautiful game. We used to play football on Sunday with our boys and we'll be like, yeah, the sun's shining. It's going to be a beautiful day for a beautiful yeah. game of football. So I think we ticked off, you know, quite a few names, but we were like, you know what? The beautiful game, everyone knows what it means. It's universal. Yeah. Let's just go with that. We resonate with it. People resonate with it. So I think that's the perfect name for us. And I think once we had that name, we never looked back or looked at any other names. Yeah, 100%. And I think, like I said, it speaks for itself. And mm. also it attracts you to it as well mm. because, you know, obviously, like I said, it's, it's, it's a positive name, if you want to call mm. it that. And I think that's one of the key things um, when people are naming it. And I can imagine you went through a bit of a process because it's so hard to actually come down with a name. Yeah. And also yeah. then when you're down the journey, look back in it and think, should I have called it that? Could it have been a different name? So yeah, I can imagine that's one of the first hurdles, let alone everything else. And then yeah. how did you kind of plan what it was exactly you wanted the actual um, podcast to look like? Because obviously, like you said before, you had conversations with friends and it was kind of just about sort of like, you know, games that had happened on the weekend. And, and typically, I think that's how people kind of go down. Because I was talking mm. to um, Joel Bayer, um, had him on and he spoke about that. That's how his journey started. He was speaking with friends and then he kind of decided, look, do you know what? This is the route that I want to go down specifically. How did that kind of happen for you guys? Um, it's a tough, it's a tough one to answer if I'm being totally honest. I think first and foremost, the most important thing for us is to stay true to ourselves. And going back to the word you just mentioned, provide the best insight possible. And I think once we build that foundation, you can now dovetail off that and do whatever you want. So obviously, initially, we didn't have the notoriety or the traction that we would have liked to, but we knew that, look, let's build our foundation. And once we build a foundation, that's when we can grow the amazing house. So first and foremost, it's about getting our friends. Yo, I'm doing this podcast. Come and support the thing. Are you down? And to be fair, all the people that we asked, they were like, yeah, we're going to support. How do you record? Initially, we started off on Skype. So we'll record nice. on Skype, no microphones, nothing. Just record your head of feedback. It felt like we were recording in the 1990s. That's how bad <laughs> the quality was. But at the end of the day, we knew that if we're providing the insight, people will still stick. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how we started um, in terms of producing content in a, on a weekly basis. And I think where people go wrong or where people let themselves down is that they don't stay consistent. We ensure that this is not a flash in the pan where we're here for two weeks and then we're missing for three months. You see what I'm trying to say? And I think we got to the back end of that season and it kind of gave us time to kind of restructure what we want to do. And I think when the season ended, what we noticed is that all the other podcasts that we see on the timeline, that we see on Instagram, they stopped producing content. But we were like, you know what? This is an opportunity. Because we're fresh, we haven't had a track record. We don't have our name out there. Let's keep producing weekly content over the summer period where everyone else stopped. That's a great point. So then we were like, you know what? There's time here. There's no football. People have time. So now let's try and target people within football to try and come onto our platform to tell their journey. So then we drew up a list of names. All right, let's start with journalist. Um, Henry Winter. Okay, we're going to put his name on a sheet of paper. Miguel Delaney. We're going to put his name on a sheet of paper. Darren Lewis. 
um, Adrian Kujumba, and we're like, you know what? Let's just, we don't know any of these people, but let's try and find a way to get in contact with them. So then obviously we done some digging, found some events and decided to say, make a commitment that all the events that we feel that we can go to, let's just go to them. Don't care what the weather is saying, if it's raining, if it's storming, let's just go. You get what I'm trying to say? Because at the end of the day, that's how you meet people. So we were going to all these events, left, right and centre. We got home at 2 a.m. sometimes, but we didn't care because we all knew that it was for the benefit of the podcast. So then we started building relationships with journalists and all of a sudden the football community started catching wind of what we were doing. So now all the journalists know of our work and they're willing to support our journey and jump on the platform. So Adrian Kajumba was the first journalist to come on and then it had a domino effect where all of them were thinking, you know what, this is a nice platform I'm going to support. So before you knew it, episode after episode after episode, we were just reading off the top journals in the country. And then we were like, you know what, let's now dig deeper into the actual game. So people that play the game, people that manage in the game, people that coach in the game, people that, you know, work behind the scenes in the game. So then we were like, where do we start? Because we don't have contacts. Like, what do we do? But we're like, you know what, let's start from the bottom. Let's start from non-league. And we had a summer where we had, you know, a few pillars in non-league come onto our platform. And the the stories we were getting from these players, we were just thinking, raw, man, this is where we want to take the podcast because the insight that we're getting, like, you don't really hear that often. And I think, like, some of the journeys are just inspirational and I think they're very relatable. So we were like, you know what, this is the direction we want to take the platform in. So... Big up Dej, my right hand. He um, used to play the game and he's got contacts in the game. And I think um, Gavin Rose was his manager at Dulwich Hamlet. And Gavin Rose came on the platform and Gavin Rose is not someone to really go on platforms and support stuff. But he was like, you know, I really like what you guys are doing. I'm coming to support it. So Gavin Rose came to our studio, you know, gave us about an hour and a half of incredible insight. And we were like, wow, that was a special, special episode. So now we've got the support from people like Gavin Rose. We feel that let's just take this to the next level and let's keep going, let's keep going, let's keep going. And to cut a long story short, I remember an episode maybe around 15 episodes or 20 episodes after Gavin Rose with Michael Bill, um, the first team coach at Rangers who have just won the SPL. And this is someone that we was actually chasing for quite a while. But it was like, boys, when the time is right, we're going to do this. And funnily enough, me and Michael Bill were from the same neck of the woods. So we had that relationship there already. So then Michael Bill came on the platform and he came on and gave a masterclass when it came to coaching. And this got picked up by all the press in Scotland, got picked up by the UK media And the episode absolutely blew up. It was the most views we've ever received. We couldn't believe it. My phone was vibrating with this article, that article. I was just like, oh, this is mad. And I think that was the moment where we felt, wow, is this what the journey is going to be about? Let's just focus. Don't celebrate, you know, the wins too much and don't get too down on the negative things that happen. Let's just work, work, work. And I think, that's what takes us to where we are today. Fantastic. There, there's a few points there. It's incredible. So number one, I really like the idea of the whole contacting journalists because when you think about it logically, they're the ones who produce articles. They're the ones who produce stories. And ultimately, they're the ones who actually, yes, you can do your own promotion, but they're the ones who can almost promote your work 100%. to worldwide. You know, 100%. Um, I think that's... No, sorry to cut you off. I think that's yeah. something that people sleep on because the journals have supported us from day dot and they've pushed our content time after time after time and I can only say thank you to them because without them continuously pushing our content we won't be where we are today we've had all the support from the journalists and they've been so welcoming into the industry yes and also it's free promotion it's free promotion which like I'm not being funny with you 
that some people to pay, like you'd have to pay thousands probably to expose your work to that many people, which they can actually cater for yes. just through putting out one article. Yeah. Um, so it's crazy. But yeah, so there was that point, which I thought was really, really important. Um, and then um, just a couple of things I wanted to kind of pick up on how you felt and sort of emotion. So like the first ever one you done, how did you feel doing that? Because I suppose you kind of get to a point where you're like, right, we're going to do this. You're recording the first one. And is there a bit of pressure almost? Because I remember when I'd done my first one and honestly, I had a script. I was like, all right, at a certain time, I'm going to say this, certain time I'm going to say that. And I was like, it doesn't happen like that. Mm. So I kind of put myself under so much pressure, unnecessarily almost. I would say the one interview where the pressure was mad was the first, first, first massive interview. And that was Rio Ferdinand. And obviously, this is a person that we've looked up to from day dot. We went to my primary school. We lived on the same road. So this is someone that I actually look up to. So yeah. I'm thinking, raw, Rio, you know, like we're going to interview Rio Ferdinand. But I think at the end of the day, you just have to... Kind of go with it. Yeah, you just have to go with it. You can't buckle under the pressure because... What does that say about you? Yeah. Like you've yeah. you've got the opportunity to interview Rio Ferdinand, own it. Go and own mm. it. Go and ask him the questions that you've always wanted to ask him. Don't fold under the pressure. So I think, yeah, we were nervous, but we had a job to do. And I hope we'd done the job to the best of our ability. 100% you did. 100%. <laughs> like, listen, that's a fantastic interview as well. And I think what is interesting is because Listen, you have perceptions sometimes of people before you go into interviews and mm. you know, not necessarily negative perceptions, but you just think to yourself, like you said, you look at people and go, oh, wow, like you're almost in awe. But when you actually talk to them, they're there to talk to you on a level. Like, you know, they're not there to go, yes, no. Like, don't get me wrong, there's some people who even I've interviewed and you have to kind of like prod a little bit just to get a bit more sort yeah. of like conversation, not even information, but conversation. Right, yeah. But like, ultimately, a lot of these people they're natural. They're like, they, they, especially talking with people like us. And I say us in terms of, I mean, you're far gone from me, but in terms of the media <sighs> side of things, you know, like journalists who are there for one thing and one thing only, which is tell me your juicy gossip and I'm going to write an article and do X, Y, Z. Whereas we're just picking these people's brains and come from similar backgrounds almost. Mm. No, no, definitely. And I think, uh, that's that's been a big benefit to us is that all these players, their managers, they're they're relatable, man. They mm. they understand the grind. They understand where we're coming from. We have the same taste in music. We dress the same. We talk the same. So th we've got an advantage. You just have to use it. You you got yeah. to connect with these players because long are the days where an Eze has to go to Sky Sports or BBC to go yeah. and tell a story. He can now come to the latest platform on ends and have a real chat with these bros. You see what I'm trying to say? And I think that's important. And I think that's the way the game's going. Yeah, no, hundred percent. And I think it's from a player's perspective, it must be so pleasing to have that because mm. like you said, it's just like almost talking, taking it back to when you first started out. It's like talking with friends rather that's than it. it being an actual interview. Um, and, and that's how I kind of always used to label is that, but now like I've taken that sort of tagline away because it's not, it's just a, discussion almost yeah. um, with a few sort of structured questions but um <laughs> but yeah but no so in terms of as well then like you said you've, you've come a long way now in terms of how you've produced your content and you know got some incredible guests on there like you said you've got Rhea Ferdinand, Jodie and Lescott, Letty King, I could go on forever there's so many names that's incredible um and not only that as well but like you said you're actually providing so much information and insight to people how mm. does that process of editing an actual episode happen because obviously you know you have the conversation with people um i know you've mentioned before on, on, on previous discussions about like you know you want to check with the person that it's okay just so that everything's fine to go out but how does that process happen in terms of recording editing and then obviously publishing tough question um it goes back to my initial point when i said me budge and dej we trust each other yeah. And I think that word trust follows our whole process. So we've had times when we've had an interview and the interview has been a bit of a firework. And at the end of the day, the player can come back and say, you know what? 
I'm not happy with that interview. If yeah. we were in it for cheap headlines, we would we would just release it, no care in the world. But we're not about that. We're all about mm. integrity and trust. So we go through a process with every single player. We offer them a chance to review the content. And if there's anything they're not happy with, we can work around that. You see what I'm trying to say? And I think the thing is in football, the word spreads quickly. So if you do good things to people, you're going to get a lot of goodwill within the football industry. Whereas if you do something that's a bit sneaky or suspicious, people will catch wind and they'll be like, no, I don't want to touch that platform. So I think building that trust with people in the community is, is massive. Yeah, no, 100%. I, th- I think as well, it goes back to the, well, I say individual, but there's three of you, but like the whole individual stuff of, you know, they're doing it because it's you rather than it's like the media elements of things as well. Um, but yeah, no, it's interesting. But like, yeah, the reason I wanted to pick up on sort of that process of it happening is because I don't know like how you actually edit your videos, but that's one of, that probably takes a, like almost a whole day in terms yeah, of so, getting it right and things like that. Yeah, so in terms of that process, if I'm being totally honest, we don't do the video editing, okay. but yeah. I make sure I review all the content before I send it to the editor and I provide them with the timestamps of what I want in the trailer, what I want edited out, the kind of graphics I want, um, just any sort of editorial stuff, I will provide them with the information and then I'll say, you know what, work your magic. And I think that's one of the key things. You need to understand that you're not perfect or you're not skilled at every single department. So for example, when it comes to building relationships, deal with that. Or when it comes to checking out the finer details, I'll be there. Or when it comes to writing up a professional email, budge, you see what I'm trying to say? Um, Or when it comes to networking, I'm there. I'm right in front of people's faces. So I think that's one of the key things. You need to understand what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses, and divide the workload between each other fairly. Yeah, no, that's key. Especially like as well, but there's three of you, you know, number one, the positive is that you've got three brains there, which you can obviously all provide ideas. Yeah. I wouldn't say negative, but the potential issue is that obviously because there are three of you, like you said, you have to have that conversation because otherwise, you know, you get three ideas rather than mm. one, one effective idea almost. Um, but obviously, like I said, again, you've, you've had an incredible success in terms of how the um, podcast and, you know, the, the YouTube channel has been progressing. Would you say there's been any sort of barriers or challenges along the way? Obviously, in terms of yeah, I suppose the obvious barrier is getting actually to the point where you are now. But yeah, what have you kind of had to overcome along that journey? Um, there's, been, there's been many barriers where you feel you're going to land this massive interview. And in the last minute, you're thinking, why, why, why are they not coming? Like, why are they not picking up their phone? Why is the club saying, no, I can't do it anymore? But that's part and parcel of the game. like, and, and I think that's where people may beat themselves up. They may try and get one player and it's a no. And then they stop trying. Yeah. But for every player we get, we probably get 20 no's. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so you just have to keep going and keep using those, you know, those barriers as, as opportunities. You just need to keep pushing and eventually you'll find your breakthrough. But I think there was a time at the back end of last year, we were tired. Like, we needed a break. We were producing content every single week. We were doing our full-time jobs and then working another six, seven hours on the podcast. And I think we just maxed out and we were so tired. And I think one of the key things is that you need to rest. When it's time to shut down from the platform and the podcast, do it. And I think that's one thing that we've really worked on this year, where we're not, overly attached all the time we know that for us to work better you need time off to rest your brain mentally so you can come back stronger the next day so I would say appreciate your time off and try to focus on other things other than the podcast yeah no 100% I think that's a fantastic point to make because you do it and again people don't see that process so they obviously see you guys bring out the content Mm -hmm. and you know even like the video say for example the video is an hour long the work that's gone into that, the contacting of the people, the negotiations of days, times, mm-hmm. what's going to be said, what's going to be talked about. Like you said, the editing process. And that's all whilst you're also trying to contact other people as well, I, I can imagine. 
it must be so challenging to actually get all of those things happening. Like you said, in, and you work full time as well. So yeah, it's my, and I think, to it. <laughs> no, 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 definitely. And there's, there's li- literally like, I try to plan my day every single day. And a few times a week, I'll just sit down and say, you know what? This one hour is going to be spent on just picking up the phone and phoning people. Literally, I'm going to spend one hour speaking yeah. to multiple people. And I think you need to manage your time because a lot of people will start a podcast and they think it's just record the content and release it. But if you want to get to a position where you're doing well and people like your product and you want to, you know, get to the top, you need to start doing a lot more behind that to elevate the platform. For example, when I'm watching back content, I don't have to watch it back. I can just lazily put it out and, and that's that. But I'm someone that when I do things, I want to do them to the best of my ability. So if I have to watch back content for three hours to make sure it's up to the standard that's required, I'm more than happy to do that. Yeah, no, it's true. I think that's so important as well. And it's needed because a lot of people, I'm sure they'll put the stuff out and probably forget everything that they've just done because they're always on go, go, go. And I think yeah. like I talk about, I know it's a bit different, but I talk about in coaching, plan, do, review. And mm. I think it's exactly the same with this. You know, yeah. it's the planning of the episode, the doing of the episode, the recording element, and then the reviewing part of it as well. So, mm. yeah, it's important. Um, now, I don't like to use this word success because I think that, you know, success has happened along multiple parts of your journey in terms of getting the podcast up and running, in terms of maintaining it, in terms of some of the guests you've had on, in terms of hitting landmarks of episodes. But away from just the guests, what would you say has been some of the biggest successes in which the Beautiful Game podcast has had and you've had as well? Because you know, you've managed to get some partnerships with, you know, Sky Sports and, you know, Eurosport. And, but what would you kind of say has been success for you? No, that, that, that's amazing. Like when you say it back, it makes me feel like, wow, we've actually accomplished something because being on Sky Sports, come on, man, that's the platform that I watched when I was 12, 13. On repeat 40. as well, watching repeat. the same thing over and over and over and I'm there. I'm there. You get what I'm trying to say? Especially when Liverpool get that W, I'm there. You see what I'm trying to say? So, when you're on platforms like Sky Sports and you're just seeing yourself back and you're thinking, wow, we actually did that. It's, it's amazing. But I would say my biggest fulfillment comes from the relationships I've been able to build within the game. Because if you spoke to me two years ago, my perspective on the game is completely different to where it is now. And I think that's because I've, I've got those relationships. I'm speaking to people I'm, sp- I'm seeing that footballers are humans, not robots. And yeah. the way I look at the game now is completely different to the way I looked at it before. And I think that's the biggest thing I'm proud about is that I look at the game differently and I've been able to build amazing relationships in football. Yeah, 100%. And, and do you know what? That, I think, is a key skill in life, building mm-hmm. relationships. Um, and again, even just building on from that, um, no pun intended, but building relationships and then maintaining relationships. Because as you mentioned you know, to myself and to people who have listened to you before, that the maintaining element is so crucial because mm. if that's lost, you know, everyone says it's, it's, it's so almost um, hard to build a relationship, so quick to lose it mm. if, if something doesn't happen the right way for that individual almost. Mm. No, um, definitely. I think building relationships is everything. Like you don't want to be that person that only messages someone when you want something. So that's why it's really important to just build a relationship, get to know someone, take an interest in someone. And I think that's that's why we've been able to get the amount of guests we've got is because we're always, you know, proactive, trying to get contacts, trying to link this lead to that lead and trying to find out the agent of this player or find out the agent of this manager. And I think the more relationships you can build, the more scope you're going to have to get to get people onto your sports platform. 100%, 100%. No, so like I said, it's incredible what you guys have achieved. Um, I mean, I was going to say in terms of moving forwards, what does the future hold for the podcast? Now, number one, I know you guys always have somebody up your sleeve, which you'll bring out, which is brilliant to see, but also mm-hmm. in terms of kind of other aspects of the podcast itself, do you ever see yourself going down any other routes or, I mean, Clubhouse is now obviously a thing. 
um, which people are, are jumping on to. But yeah, what do you see as the future for the Beautiful Game podcast? Except for obviously keep on growing and growing and growing. I think you've answered my question to keep growing. If growing. I'm being totally honest, I'm not going to sit here and say we want to achieve X, Y, Z because that's not how we think. But yeah. what I do know is that this platform is bigger than us. And there's a bigger reason behind the platform. We're just the faces of the platform. And I think we've got plans, you know, to iterate, to keep improving, to take the content to the next level and to also branch away from podcasts. So you just have to wait and see if I'm being totally honest, but we've got big things lined up. Nice no, quality. Now, listen, it excites me to hear that as well. So I can imagine <laughs> that when people listen to it, they'll be excited yeah, as well. No. But no, listen, it's been incredible. Doc, honestly, oh, uh, pleasure, words, words can't really describe like how inspirational the movement is that you guys are doing. Um, I spoke, like I said, I spoke to Joel uh, Bayer about a couple of weeks ago and I said the exact same to him. I think you guys and him have literally, you've created pathways. You've created pathways and opportunities for people like myself um, and other people within the industry to look and go, do you know what? This is possible. It's like when you look at a player and a player makes it into the game and you go, do you know what? I could do that. Yeah. So yeah. listen, all I can do is number one, say thank you. And number two, say, listen, I'm looking incredibly forward to what's coming out and no, um, I can see you. you guys rise. No, thank you, man. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me on and I'll continue to support what you're doing, bro. No, fantastic. And also as well, yeah, but I have to say before I go, Beautiful Game Podcast. You need to go and subscribe to it. I believe Thanks. it's available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple. Apple. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then obviously <laughs> as well, go and hit them up on the uh, socials as well. So Instagram and Twitter. Um, yeah. Don't think I've missed anything out there. All good, bro. Clubhouse as well. We're there. Oh, uh, yes, yes, of course, of course. Yeah, and Clubhouse as well. Friday night at eight o'clock, yeah. is that correct? Yeah, yeah, Friday eight yeah, o'clock. I know it. I'm a fan. I'm a fan. I'm a fan. I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, listen, it's incredible. Honestly, thank you so much for taking the time to join me. Um, like Thanks I said, on. people listen and watch it. Make sure you subscribe um, to all of the platforms across the Beautiful Game podcast um, and look forward to seeing what you've got coming up soon. Mm-hmm.